Hello, welcome back. In this segment, I want to talk about an important RSA related capability. It's called RSA key encapsulation mechanism. This is an ISO standard. We can use RSA to encrypt uh, large messages if we follow the approach that I'm going to talk about. So remember, um, the receiver has to send a message to the sender. In this case, Alice is the sender. Okay. Uh, the public key must be exchanged from the receiver to the sender first. So uh, assume that um, Alice trusts the public key. Uh, uh, you know, let's assume E comma N are trusted and vetted. So Bob is a real Bob and his public key is E comma N. So Alice has E comma N. We already talked about RSA. So I will not uh, talk all the details about what N and E and so on. You know that N is made of two primes P and Q. Um, P and Q are private, to only Bob knows it, okay. Now the question is, if I need to encrypt a message M, um, one of the constraints is M must be smaller than N, which is a problem because N is usually um, 256, uh, 256 um, byte number or something like that. So it's much, much smaller. Suppose you have a gigabyte of data, you can't encrypt it with the raw RSA directly. So the approach that I'm going to talk about is, is a very interesting approach. So what Alice is going to do, uh, she's going to generate a random number R from the group Z star N. So randomly picks an element from the group Z star N, which is easy to do. We talked about how to do that, not a big challenge for Alice. So she will do that. And she will then apply the RSA function, which we have talked a lot, uh, is R power E mod N. This is the RSA encryption function, right, in mod N. Now, this, the interesting thing is, she's going to derive a key K by applying a special function. Let's call it KDF, key derivation function, okay. We don't go into the details of the characteristics of key derivation function, but assume key derivation function is like a random function, which will take your R as input and uh, say you specify, uh, let's assume you're going to use AES in 256 bit um, configuration, then you say, give me a 256 bit um, a, a, a random key, okay? Take my R as input and give me back a key K. Now, Alice is going to use the key K uh, to encrypt a message, let's say, um, AES, for example, or any blo approved block cipher for that matter. She's going to use AES of some message uh, M. She will encrypt using the key cage she just derived. And this becomes the um, actual cipher text. Let me call it C prime. Okay. Okay. So now the question is uh, how can Bob recover M in this context? As you can see, in order for Bob to um, recover M, he needs to apply AES also here. So he needs to do AES inverse, AE inverse, but he can't do that because he doesn't know the key K. So what Alice has to do, she has to send a few things to Bob now. She has to send to Bob um, C. This is the C I'm talking about. Of course, she can't send K, otherwise any, anybody can recover M. So she's going to send us just C and C prime, okay. C prime is the AES part. So what Bob is going to do, it's going to take the C. So let's assume C is sent to uh, Bob. This is in clear text, but uh, we are assuming RSA is a hard problem, meaning given C, we can't recover R. So Bob is going to magically use his private key D, right? Uh, which will uh, reverse the C and recover R. So what will be the Bob's uh, R? Bob's R is nothing but R it is C power D mod N, which is basically the RSA decryption function. We have also talked about this. Okay, so Bob has recovered R. Now Bob is no different from Alice. So he can run, um, he, he will do the same here. He will call the KDF function, the key derivation function they have to agree upon, of, co of course. Um, and uh, or again, 256 bit, those agree, those must be agreed up front. K, KDF and the parameters, and you know, am I using KDF, like using 
256 uh, bit KDF or what, what is the output KDF size? That must be agreed upon up front. Uh, okay, so now Bob is going to get the same K and uh, because it's a deterministic function and then he's going to take a in AES inverse of it, of course, uh, meaning decryption of C prime, right? Using the key K. So he got the key K. So he will just take the key K and he will take C prime. Remember C prime means the AES inverse of the message. So he's going to get the message EM back. That's basically the idea of key encapsulation mechanism. Um, this, this mechanism is, uh, is part of IS4 standard. I will show you uh, the details in a moment. And uh, the novelty of this is that the message M, right, need not be smaller than N. M can be larger than N. So we are not bounded by the RSA modulus size, which is usually really, really small I mean, in terms of the length, in terms of number of bits. Uh, N can be 2048 bit, which is only 256 bytes, which is not enough for a large file to be encrypted, for example. You could use this technique because given C, it's difficult to find R. That's the RSA problem. This is just RSA encryption, right? R power E mod N is the RSA encryption. And this is RSA decryption. Okay. So what you're actually encrypting using RSA is just um, a small number R, meaning uh, R belongs to Z star N. Okay, randomly chosen R. So every time you run this protocol, R must be uniquely chosen. Okay, um, even if you encrypt the same message, you want to have a different ciphertext. So you can choose a different R, so you will get a different K. Therefore, you will get a different C prime. So this mechanism, although I'm talking a little informally, is secure against chosen plain text attack because R is chosen randomly and it's difficult to find R from C. It is also secure against a chosen ciphertext attack. If somebody modifies the C, what will happen? Um, they will get a, when Bob decrypts it, he will get a modified R, which means when, when it plugged into KDF, you'll get some gibberish key K. So AES inverse of some gibberish key K of a ciphertext will give some, some completely different gibberish than M. So you can't uh, modify C in a controlled fashion to produce a meaningful message on, on the receiver end, unless you know the R, because we assume that the caveat is that we assume the key D, KDF, the key derivation function, behaves like a random oracle. Okay, so in practice, um, uh, what this KDF is doing is it is calling, say, SHA 256 multiple times in a loop. Uh, there is some, some, some structure to the KDF derivation, but you can imagine that any small change in R, in, even if one, one bit is flipped, um, the, the, R that, um, the, the R that is recovered will be very different later, okay? So, well, uh, to be more precise, if you flip the R, only one bit of R, the key K that will be obtained from the KDF will be very different, okay? It's difficult to tell uh, exactly which bit is flipped and so on. Okay, that's basically it. This is the, the idea. And remember to summarize, your, your random number is chosen from Z star N. And then you're basically calling RSA, let me call this RSA of um, RSA of R. You're encrypting R you, and you get the ciphertext C. And here you're basically doing RSA inverse. So decrypting RSA of the ciphertext C that will give you the input R, right? That's basically the decryption. Once the R is uh, shared between the two parties, then this is straightforward. You call the KDF, KDF, you will get the same key K because KDF is a deterministic function. And then you can do your AES or whatever block cipher that was agreed upon. Okay, that's the, the main uh, part of this uh, discussion. I will now show you um, how it, this is handled in, um, in Bouncy Castle library, for example. Okay, very quickly, I'll share that. Okay, so what you're seeing um, is Bouncy Castle implementation of RSA key encapsulation mechanism, ISO standard 18033-2. Uh, okay, so very important points I will explain. As you can see, there's a key KD, KDF, key derivation function. Um, and uh, let me show you 
you need to pass the key derivation function as an argument. It could be a function based on SHA2. Um, okay, and then I'll show you the most important ones. The encrypt will uh, basically, um, well, this is the, the key, the public model is N and E, and the encrypt is generating a random R, and then applies R, uh, R power E mod N as I talked on the whiteboard. Okay, then you, you call generate key, which is basically uh, going to apply the key derivation function. Let me show you that. Here is the generate key function, which is calling the K, KDF, the key derivation function, and then it returns the key. So the decryption function is also similar. Uh, it will uh, apply the private key D, right? As you can see, C power D mod N, as I talked about on the whiteboard, and then um, generates the same key K. The novelty of this scheme is that you don't have to deal with padding. There is no padding or Oracle or whatsoever in this scenario. It's a very uh, straightforward uh, in terms of the security proof. Although I'm not proving the mathematics more precisely, but you get the idea that um, in order to uh, uh, use AES, you need a key and you are sharing the key uh, using RSA. But what you're doing is you're first generating a random number R, encrypt that R using RSA, but you're not directly using the R as the key for your uh, AES. You're sending that R to uh, HKDF or K key derivation function more generally. That gives you a random number and that random number is what you're using uh, as your AES key, okay. That's all, that's basically the main purpose of this discussion. And here's one simple uh, test that I, I saw on the RSA key encapsulation test as part of the bouncy cache library. It's a little dated, so some of the parameters are old, like for example, they're using um, here 1024-bit uh, RSA, as you can see here, this is 1024-bit RSA, which is not recommended anymore, um, but it's okay, but it's just for testing purpose. Um, so you can see here, they're creating a KDF. They're using a SHA digest as input to, and they will run the KDF algorithm using the SHA algorithm. Um, the KDF itself is formally preci precisely specified here on this um, uh, standard document. Uh, you can see here the inner workings of KDF. Let me show you that. So KDF itself is formally pre uh, presented in the standard. All they're doing is essentially calling the SHA functions, whatever SHA functions, like hash functions in general. They, they suppose X is your input and L is the length that you would like to have in terms of the number of bytes, whatnot. Um, what they do is they take your X, append it with one uh, or in, uh, they append to zero first, call the hash function. Then they call the hash function again with the X followed by one and so on. So they keep on calling hash function multiple times um, uh, so that you get a random number as output. That, that is the, the, the KDF part that I talked about on the whiteboard, okay. So the security proof is more theoretical than this one. Um, they model the, the, the key derivation function as a random oracle function, meaning um, it's difficult to find the image given the output, it is difficult to find collusions and so on. Um, I'm not going into the formal security proof, but I'm just giving you the idea of how this is um, conducted from a more practical perspective. Okay. So I do understand the importance of uh, security proof, just to be clear. Okay, so we saw um, that. And then here is the actual test case. You see here, you're creating the key encapsulation object using the key derivation function. Um, this is the secure random in this case we are using. And then you are, uh, uh, you are calling the encrypt function that will give you the key, the AES key in, in my case, which is just 128 bit AES key. Um, and then in order for decryption, uh, you will be using your private key to decrypt, meaning the receiver will use the private key to decrypt. It will extract the R and then um, of course, inside the code, uh, we can see the decryptor, decryptor will use the private key and then applies again the same uh, generate key function to generate the key that I talked about on the whiteboard. Okay, so that's all. And um, here it is to sum up. Alice wants to talk to Bob. 
So Bob has to send the public key first, n and e. Alex generates an random number r uh, from the group z star n. Um, and then um, Alex applies RSA of r. Okay, send the resulting ciphertext c to, to Bob. So this is c. Okay, to Bob. Bob can recover r by using his private key. Once r is obtained, uh, Alice and Bob are no different. They have everything they need except the fact that Alice doesn't have the private key of Bob, which she doesn't she doesn't need anymore. I mean, she doesn't need the private key at all. Other than that, um, you see here they both apply the KDF, and then um, Alice, on the other hand, applies AES encryption. Bob decrypts it using the uh, key K that uh, he received. Okay, okay. In fact, he derived from the KD, KD, KDF function. All right, that's all. Thank you.